coming to today's webinar, Health Literacy of People Living with Mental Health or Substance Use Disorders. My name is Nora Barnett. I am a Health Professions Outreach Specialist with Region 6 of the Network of the National Library of Medicine, and I'm going to host today's session. Um, a few things to cover before we get started on our presentation. All attendees have been muted to reduce background noise, but we do welcome your comments and questions. Please use the chat box to share your comments and the Q&A to submit any questions you have for our speaker. So there's a chat box and there's a Q&A. Um, Miles Diaz Castell. Region 6's Communications and Finance Coordinator is providing technical assistance today, and he'll be keeping an eye on the questions with me. We'll queue up your questions uh, and save them for our speaker to address at the end of the presentation. Uh, when you post in the chat box, please be sure to select everyone from the drop-down menu uh, to ensure that both Miles and I see them. Closed caption has been enabled and it will be available by clicking on the icon with the three dots and selecting closed caption. We're recording today's session and it's available, uh, excuse me, we're recording today's session and we'll post it on NNLM's YouTube channel within a couple of weeks. At that time, all of you who have registered uh, for the webinar will receive an email with a link to the recording. So keep an eye out for that. This class is eligible for one Medical Library Association continuing education credit, one Consumer Health Information Specialist credit, and one Certified Health Information Education Specialist or CHES contact hour, which you'll be able to claim through the evaluation link and enrollment code that we share with you at the end of the session. Uh, and speaking of that evaluation, your feedback matters to us and it helps us improve future trainings. So after we're done, please, please do take a moment to complete that. As a reminder, by registering for this webinar, all attendees have agreed to abide by the NNLM Code of Conduct, which is meant to foster a respectable and professional learning environment. Because, because some of you uh, might be first time attendees to an NNLM webinar, I'll share just a little bit about NNLM. Um, NLM, or the National Library of Medicine, is one of the 27 institutes and offices of the National Institutes of Health. It's the world's largest biomedical library and produces online resources such as PubMed and Medline Plus. NNLM, the network of the National Library of Medicine, uh, is an outreach program of NLM working to ensure health professionals and the public have equal access to health information. NNLM is made up of seven regional medical libraries, three national offices, and four national centers, all providing training, funding, and engagement opportunities to over 9,000 NNLM member organizations. Uh, today's session was organized by Region 6 as part of our Speaker Spotlight series. This series features guest expert speakers presenting on topics of interest to all of our users, including librarians, public health professionals, educators, clinicians, and others who work with health information. You can learn more about our upcoming sessions by, um, by subscribing to our Region 6 newsletter, which uh, we'll provide a link to at the end. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Taylor Deegan. Dr. Deegan is a postdoctoral research fellow at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Center, University of New South Wales, Australia. She is also a registered clinical psychologist working in private practice. She has research expertise and interest in people living with mental illness and substance use disorders. Her PhD research focused on the health literacy of people accessing specialist mental health and substance use disorder treatment. Taylor has uh, experience evaluating treatment services, implementing a telephone-based continuing care intervention for people discharged from residential treatment services, and is currently involved in a phase three randomized controlled trial examining mirtazapine as a pharma, uh, uh, pharmacotherapy treatment option for methamphetamine dependence, the TINA trial. Taylor is currently developing research projects looking at online interventions for substance use disorders and health literacy using co-design. 
And I'll just say that when I decided to look into this topic, I, I scoured PubMed to see what research had been done. And I was so impressed and intrigued by Dr. Deegan's work um, that I reached out to her. Uh, but she was across the world in Australia. And I, I didn't know what to expect with this cold email. To my delight, uh, Taylor, Dr. Deegan was more than willing to share her expertise with all of us here by being a guest speaker, um, not to mention she has been extremely patient as we've navigated date and time differences and logistical challenges to put on this webinar. I'm excited to hear her presentation. And um, with that, I'm going to turn over the session to Dr. Deegan. All right, hello. Uh, I'm assuming you can hear me, Nora. Is that, that sounds okay? Cool, um, great. And you can see the slides okay as well. Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, what a uh, beautiful introduction. Thank you, Nora. Um, it's a, a real privilege to, to be here today. Um, as Nora said, I am across the other side of the country or the world, not the country. Um, I'm in Australia. Um, I am uh, based in Sydney. And as Nora said, um, at the University of uh, New South Wales. Um, it was so wonderful kind of jumping on here today um, and also to see how many people are attending um, and how many people are commenting and, and saying hello from um, across the US. So um, I see you and I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, and hopefully uh, uh, at the end of today's webinar, um, you'll kind of come away with some knowledge and, and some, some tools to, to take away and, and carry forward. So um, yeah, thanks again for having me. Um, so as Nora said, um, I'm here to present on the health literacy of people living with mental health and um, or substance use disorders. Um, and she's always uh, already done a, a beautiful um, introduction. So I thank her for that. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm Dr. Taylor Deegan. Um, I work at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre, University of New South Wales as a postdoctoral research fellow. Um, and as she also mentioned, I'm a, I'm a clinical psychologist as well. Um, I'm fairly early career. Um, so I'm only um, just over a year postdoc. So this is kind of, um, you know, navigating kind of new research areas is, is um, new territory for me, but um, something that I um, am, am super excited to, to be embarking on. Um, as you'd also probably know when you signed up for today's webinar, um, the, these were kind of the learning objectives or the things that I hope that, that you guys can, can come away with um, today. So looking at understanding that the multifaceted nature of health literacy um, and more specifically, I guess, then in the context of mental health and substance use disorders. Uh, to understand and explore health literacy, how health literacy impacts on, on their health outcomes, their service use, and their post-treatment outcomes. And then lastly, just to kind of identify some practical strategies and tools um, to address health literacy challenges faced by this uh, population. Um, so I guess just to highlight that this uh, the, the presentation today is based on um, a program of research I did as part of my PhD. Um, I did my PhD um, at the University of Wollongong, um, so a bit of a smaller university than, than New South Wales, um, but that's where I spent my time doing my PhD. So um, this research that I'm talking to you about is, is going to be uh, discussing a series of studies that we did um, that looked at health literacy in this population. I just want to also highlight um, that, that I'll, I will be using some acronyms throughout um, just in text. So um, like SUD to refer to substance use disorder, um, SMI to refer to serious mental illness, and the HLQ to refer to health literacy questionnaire, but you'll see that they come up as we go through. So I think it is really important to start with defining what health literacy is. And um, I'm completely aware that, that some of you might be already experts kind of in this field, um, or have some knowledge or, or you might know what health literacy means. But I think it's always kind of important to, to just start there and, and I guess particularly for people who, who might be new to, to this uh, concept. Um, so I like to use the World Health Organization definition that they put out in 2021. Um, I will talk a little bit more about definition changes and what that's looked like um, in a little bit. Um, but I guess just to start, this is talking about how health literacy is the personal knowledge, the competencies that someone might accumulate through daily activities, social interactions, and across generations. They will then use that personal knowledge and competencies, um, which is then mediated by organizational structures, the availability of resources that enable one to access, understand, appraise, and use them 
information services in ways that promote and maintain good health and well-being for themselves and those around them. Um, really wordy, uh, but I, I guess this is just highlighting that an individual will come with their own uh, skills and set of abilities, um, and that that's gained through you know their, their daily activities, their daily interaction with say like schools or employment um, or, or socially as well, so relationships with um, friends or socially, um, and also across generations. So thinking about how someone might acquire health literacy skills um, and how that can also be passed through generations, so from parents or caregivers, um, and how that that uh, that's the skill and competencies that someone might have then interacts with the organisational structures, services and the, the resources that they have available. So this definition is something that's fairly new in the sense of health literacy used to be really understood as like an individual's responsibility. Um, but it's really nice to see um, that there's this shift and we can see it in this definition that organisations and services actually play a really critical role when it comes to health literacy. So that's just where that's getting at um, in this definition. And then as some of you may know, you know, health literacy is about using that to access, understand, navigate the healthcare system, to use health information, and to do that in a way that they come out of it at the end, being able to um, look after and maintain their health, um, and not only theirs, but the health and well-being of, of others as well. So that's, I guess, just um, the, the definition that I'm going with in terms of this presentation today. So I think it's also important to start with um, looking at that there is um, three types of health literacy, and this comes out of um, Nutbeam, um research, so, so many, many years ago now in, in 2000, um, and he describes that there's, there's three, three types there. So the first one is, is functional health literacy, and I'm going to kind of harp on this a little bit um, as I go throughout because this is kind of important to, to, to remember and understand. So functional health literacy is basically, it's, it's the basic reading writing skills. So kind of basic literacy skills um, that someone might have to be able to understand and use health information. So I guess just highlighting here that these three types will build on one another. So functional health literacy is kind of like that basic surface level. So reading, writing abilities. The second one is interactive and communi communicative um, health literacy. And this again builds on functional health literacy. It's the more advanced cognitive and literacy skills that someone will have that then actually allows them to go further with that and interact with healthcare providers um, to enhance their ability to interpret, apply information to, to varying uh, circumstances. So um, that's kind of where uh, that allows someone to be a bit more versatile or have a bit more autonomy in terms of their healthcare. And then the very last one is looking at critical health literacy. So again, thinking critical at the very top, um, that again builds on these uh, types types further to, to be the more advanced cognitive skills that someone will have to critically analyse information to then exert greater control over their life. So the three types, and again, just highlighting that functional health literacy in terms of um, where we've, we've come from. And this is kind of uh, doing that here. So looking at the history of health literacy, and this is really important um, and really fascinating because it was first proposed in the 1970s by Simmons. Um, and it initially just focused on functional health literacy. So as I said, that, that first kind of surface level or basic level of health literacy. And health literacy as a construct was understood as functional health literacy only. So reading and writing abilities. Um, Basically, uh, so much research has been done in the health literacy space, but, but a lot of the older research um, was literally just measuring someone's ability to read and write, and then they were using that to then infer on, on their health literacy level. So I guess the, the good news is, is that um, times have, have changed and research has, has changed quite dramatically since then. Um, and health literacy is now being considered to be um, much more multidimensional. So recognising that, yeah, it's not just functional health literacy um, that we need to pay attention to or that we need to measure. We really need to consider that, that there's actually, you know, uh, health literacy is multifaceted. There's multiple dimensions to this construct. Um, and we do need to look at that and we do need to start to consider and measure that. So I will come back to that point um, in a minute. So as I said, like it's not um, it's not unknown. Like health literacy is a really well researched area. Um, so we know a, a lot about it. Um, there's there's a lot of research out there in um, like physical health populations. So health literacy has been um, 
yeah, well researched in, you know, uh, populations with chronic um, health conditions and physical health illnesses um, and also general populations as well. Um, so what we know from the research is that um, people with lower health literacy do experience greater health inequalities, they experience poorer health outcomes, um, and it's been linked to, to poorer health behaviours as well. Um, and what's on the screen here is just some examples of what some of the research has found in terms of low health literacy and its relationship to these things. So, for example, um, it has been found that lower health literacy is linked to um, difficulties with managing, uh, with self-managing care, um, poorer health status, uh, negative actions and attitudes towards healthcare treatments, um, unhealthy behaviours as well, so things like harmful eating habits or, or poor physical exercise. Um, lower health literacy has been also linked to increased hospitalisation, so, so they're more likely to be hospitalised. Um, and, and this one's quite interesting as well. So like poor aftercare engagement and poor treatment adherence. So um, potentially less likely to adhere to, to um, say like doctor's recommendations or maybe they've had surgery and, and post-surgery they need to look after um, themselves in a particular way. Researchers found that they're less likely or less able to do that. Um, and I find these ones quite fascinating and interesting as well. Like this, this sense of shame and heightened self-conscious consciousness that uh, people with lower health literacy might experience, as well as low, lower social support. And I think these are quite interesting in the context of that World Health Organization definition, thinking back how that highlighted the um, how someone's health literacy skills and abilities um, can be passed down through generations and also through social interaction with others. So thinking about like, is this a group that, that maybe um, have low social support? Um, and this is kind of increasing this sense of, of shame. Um, so again, highlighting like this is not, um, you know, we know a lot about health, health literacy um, and I guess, guess this is where um, I have kind of come, become known to the concept and then decided to look into it um, in more specific mental health and substance use populations. So again, jumping back just a little bit before I do get into that, um, to talk a little bit about measuring health literacy. So I've talked about functional health literacy and how it used to be quite um, unidimensional and, and in terms of how we measured health literacy. So we literally just measured someone's reading and writing abilities, um, whereas due to the, the shift in, in this multidimensional um, movement, so towards recognising health literacy as being more than just reading and writing, um, there's been some measures and, um, uh, that have been developed uh, in light of this. So one of the ones, and I bring this one to, to our particular, to your particular attention, and that's because, and this is one that I looked at throughout my program of research, so the one that I'm going to be discussing today. Um, this is also one that's um, been used across the globe um, and is used with, with government agencies and things like that as well in terms of measuring population health literacy. So it's the health literacy questionnaire, and some of you may, um, may or may not know this. Um, it's developed by Richard Osborne in, in 2013. And it's a 44 item self-report measure. And basically it aims to capture the complex and comprehensive nature that we now know the health literacy construct to be. Um, as I mentioned, like it, it's been used across the globe and, and, and there's so many studies that have used it now. And so there is really strong reliability and validity with this questionnaire. And what it does quite uniquely is it actually captures health literacy strengths and weaknesses across domains rather than producing like an overall composite health literacy score. So we can actually use this questionnaire to, to separate or it, it acknowledges that people might have strengths and weaknesses in different domains on health literacy. So they might not all just be low or high um, in terms of their health literacy, but, but it can vary. Um, and we'll discuss that in a little bit. I thought it might also be helpful to just show you, um, and hopefully this isn't too overwhelming, I'll explain it um, to you so it hopefully feels less overwhelming, um, but these are the nine domains of the health literacy questionnaire. So you can see um, one and it goes all the way around to nine up here. So basically the, the 44 items, um, so the person will get the questionnaire, it's self-report, um, there's 44 questions, 44 items, um, and they'll go through and, and answer the questions um, and rate uh, each question on, on a Likert scale. So from one to five, domains one to five, the Likert scale is based on agreeance. 
So the Likert scale is a four-point scale from one is strongly disagree to five being strongly agree. So um, the, these are, again, some items, example items um, related to that. And then what you see is that, as, of, as you can see over here, from six to nine, this is looking at difficulty. So the reason why it's separated is the Likert scale changes. So this Likert scale is one to four. This Likert scale is um, one to five. So um, domain six to nine um, is from one is very difficult to five being very easy. So it's just, I guess, important to highlight that. Um, and you'll see when, when we look at it in my research that that we do have to separate the two because then um, the Likert scales are different. So on, on, on this side, it's agreeance. On this side, it's difficulty. So as you can see, um, there's uh, a whole lot of kind of domains there and it, it covers a real um, nice comprehensive view of, of what we now know health literacy to be. So an example of that is, you know, domain two, um, do they have sufficient information to manage their health? So an item related to that is like, I'm sure I have all the information I need to manage my health effectively. Uh, have social support for health. So, so domain four, um, an item related to that is I have at least one person who can come to medical appointments with me. Uh, this one down here, domain seven, so the ability to navigate the healthcare system. Um, and an item is there, can they work, how difficult is it for them to work out what is the best care for them? Um, and say the last one there, domain nine. So the ability to understand health information well enough to know what to do with it. So an example item there is how difficult is it for you to understand what your healthcare providers are asking you to do? So really, really a big variety. Um, and again, um, just to highlight here that the health literacy questionnaire is actually based on Nutbeam's three um, types of health literacy. So functional, interactive and critical. Um, so, so those three types are actually mapped onto, onto the domains there too. Um, I guess I should also mention that higher scores on this questionnaire um, reflect uh, higher health literacy. So this might be somewhat interesting for any um, stats nerds out there. Um, I am kind of not one of them, um, but I thought it was important for me to, to highlight um, this uh, analysis that we've used in terms of um, the, the PhD research, because it's just a way to, that I describe um, the results and it might seem a little bit clearer. So there are obviously various ways that you can analyze um, health the health literacy questionnaire and that they recommend um, some um, like in their uh, uh, questionnaire. Um, but uh, one way that, that we uh, analyzed uh, the results from all of our program of research is using latent profile analysis. Um, basically, in short, um, this is a statistical modeling approach that identifies distinct subgroups of individuals based on a set of variables. So based on um, the, the sample that we're um, measuring from, so they'll fill out the questionnaires. Um, we will take like all of their average scores across the, the domains and then basically input it into um, <clears throat> this statistical uh, modeling approach, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, it will produce uh, distinct subgroups. So basically groups people together in the sample based on, in our case, the health literacy questionnaire. So it actually enables us to, to kind of see um, of this sample, are there different uh, profiles or are there different subgroups of people? And again, this will make more sense when I discuss the research. Um, but uh, again, just to highlight, the profiles are not predetermined. So the latent profile analysis based on a set of indices will recommend or tell us which, um, how many groups there are. Um, so it's not predetermined. Okay, so kind of just shifting gears a little bit just to kind of talk a little bit about uh, people living with mental health and substance use disorders. So mental illness, which, which includes substance use disorders, um, according to the American Psychiatric Association, is considered to be a health condition involving changes in emotion, thinking or behaviour, which are associated with distress and or difficulties with daily functioning in a range of areas. So, um, for example, their social life, their, their work, schooling, employment um, or, or um, difficulties in functioning with, with family and other relationships there. 
of of concern, and I, I think we, we probably know this by now, is that mental disorders um, uh, remain among the, the top 10 leading causes of burden worldwide. So in t- 2019, one in eight people around the world were living with a mental disorder. Um, so, so super high, like 970 million people were living with a mental health disorder. Um, and what we know is that the research says that anxiety and depressive disorders are the most common. Um, I think it's pretty rare these days that, you know, either yourself or or, or, um, someone around you is not impacted by mental illness. And so I think this is something that we can all um, probably really relate to in terms of its importance and its significance um, in the world at the moment. So... There is also like a a subgroup of of people who experience more serious mental illness. And the reason why I'm going through this is because um, in our research, we um, sampled people who were accessing treatment. So accessing community mental health treatment and accessing substance use treatment. And so I guess in theory, the people who are accessing um, these types of treatments in Australia, in an Australian context, are kind of on more of the severe mental illness end. So that that kind of more um, uh, serious side um, where, where they're experiencing more serious impairment in their functioning. So that's why I kind of bring this to, to your attention here, is that individuals with serious mental illness are people living with mental illness, but it results in that more serious impairment in functioning. And I guess some, some disorders might be, um, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder. This can also include like other anxiety disorders and things like that, um, depending on their level of um, uh, the impairment that the person experiences in terms of functioning, or if say that the uh, depression or anxiety disorder um, is um, quite chronic um, or maybe treatment resistant. So um, what we know is that people with serious mental illness often experience a range of comorbid physical health issues and co-occurring mental health disorders. So um, physical health health issues, the research suggests that like cardiovascular disease are more likely to um, have comorbid cardiovascular disease or cancer. Um, And uh, again, like co-occurring mental health disorders. So it often doesn't occur just in isolation. Um, What we also know is that it's really concerning a reduced life expectancy of up to two decades can be observed for for this group. Um, And they experience a greater risk of experiencing comorbid substance use disorders as well. So an example of this is that um, people say living with psychosis, the lifetime rate of alcohol use or dependence is 51% and illicit drug use or dependence is 55%. And this is at least double the rate of the general population, which sits around like 25% to 9% respectively. So quite significant um, in terms of the the increased risk or the increased uh, likelihood or rate that they um, use substances. Um, Obviously the relationship between Uh, mental health and substance use disorders is bi-directional. So, um, you know, uh, someone could could have a serious mental illness and and that could lead to to substance use, but also vice versa. Someone could experience a substance use disorder and that could potentially lead or exacerbate um, some, some mental health. So, I guess this is why in in our research, we wanted to capture both. So you'll see I talk about both populations with serious mental illness and then also um, populations um, with with substance use disorders. Um, They're often looked at separately uh, in in the the healthcare system and and you guys probably experienced this in in the US too. Um, In in terms of if someone's wanting treatment for a serious mental illness, they will go here. And if someone's wanting treatment for a substance use disorder, they will go here. So I guess in, in terms of our research, we do separate them, but we do look at um, in each sample um, their, their comorbidity with other mental health conditions. So as I said, like we, we do look at the treatments. So, so we um, sample people who are already accessing specialist treatment. So um, according to, to our definition here in Australia, so specialist um, serious mental illness or specialist, uh, sorry, mental health treatment. Um, It's services providing that like treatment, rehab or community health support, which is targeted at people living with mental illness, most often those with serious mental illness. And it does include specialist substance use treatment services. 
So what we know is that this is a population who do require consistent uh, treatment and access to, to our specialist services. Um, you know, they, they need regular access to our healthcare system. They often require like a complex mix of treatment um, upon which we know that health, a good health literacy skills are required in order to do this. Um, you know, our health systems are really complex. And so um, someone kind of needs at least a basic level of health literacy, I think, to, to navigate the healthcare system effectively and appropriately. Um, again, just as highlighting, you know, 65.5% of adults living with a serious mental illness accessed a mental health service in 2019. Um, and as I already have mentioned, treatment is often separated for, for, the, for the two groups. <clears throat> So I guess it might be obvious in terms of the point I'm trying to make around like why health literacy? Like why did I decide to, to come along and, and, and think that health literacy is important for this population? To me up front, it was quite obvious. Um, <clears throat> and that's because there are so many similarities in the health outcomes and the healthcare use of people accessing specialist mental health and substance use treatment services and people with lower health literacy. So what we know for people um, living with serious mental illness or substance use disorders, that the research has um, found that they might have lower adherence to treatment and healthcare recommendations. They experience poor health outcomes. They're less likely to seek healthcare. They tend to experience lower healthcare use. They experience poor quality of healthcare and less likely to access routine screening for safe physical Ill illnesses. So, these difficulties are also very common experiences for people with lower health literacy. Um, and so I guess to, to me, it makes sense that, that, that this might be a really important thing for us to look into, particularly given this is a population who really need to, to be able to ad adequately access healthcare systems um, and treatment options appropriately. So again, I'm about to brace yourself. I'm about to go through the research. So it's coming, I promise. Um, but I guess just an important caveat to, to start with. Um, and that's just to, to let you know that, you know, the following research, as I've emphasized, is focused on populations accessing specialist mental health and substance use disorder treatment services. So um, I guess I just highlight, just be careful in terms of when I'm not trying to, um, just in, in terms of generalizing the results to small, um, I guess, general population mental illness and, and experience. This is a population who are um, likely more on that serious mental illness end um, and are accessing kind of intensive services for, for their mental health. Also, it's an Australian context. Um, we only looked at the, these studies because um, we are based in Australia. We, we only sampled them in an Australian context. So just to highlight that as well. Um, and I'll also talk about profiles. So I don't know if you remember um, that the um, latent profile analysis I was talking about, but I do mention profiles um, throughout each slide. Um, and just to highlight, these are relative to the population. So profiles will differ based on different um, the different samples that, that we're using um, and that the health literacy questionnaire doesn't have cutoff scores. So hopefully it will make more sense um, in, in a minute. I'm just going to have a very quick drink of water. Okay. <clears throat> So this is just a bit of an overview of the program of research and something that I guess if you're looking at the slides later on, it can be just helpful just to come back to this, um, just so you can understand uh, the progression of the research program that we did. So to, to start with, we did a systematic review um, of, of health literacy and mental health populations. Then we did a cross-sectional study which looked at health literacy of people accessing community mental health treatment and compared this uh, compared the health literacy to the general population, general Australian population, and a substance use disorder sample accessing residential treatment. The third study we did was a cross-sectional study examining the health literacy and health service utilisation of people accessing residential substance use treatment. And then the final study was a longitudinal study examining the health literacy of people accessing residential treatment over time. So I'm going to start with number one, so the systematic review. So I'm not sure um, some of you may know this, but I guess when um, maybe embarking on a program of research or an idea, um, it's important to, to systematically review what's already out there. So we want, you know, we kind of, um, we, we knew about the health literacy concept. Um, we knew that, that it was likely, there was likely some links there um, in terms of um, people living with a mental health or substance use disorder. Um, but we wanted, there was no systematic review that had been done. Um, so we, we, we embarked on that. 
that. Um, and I guess what it really highlighted to us, which is what we what we thought, is that research was so limited. There were only 14 studies out of all the studies in the world um, and we didn't have a, a date cut off. So it's, it's back for as long as it uh, possibly can be. Um, there was only 14 studies that uh, actually looked at health literacy in a mental health uh, substance use disorder population. Um, a very interesting thing, but unsurprising for us, is that most studies use functional health literacy measures. So um, it was like 10 out of the 14 studies used um, the, the functional health literacy measures that we know. So these are just examples of, of um, some functional health literacy measures. One's called the TOFLA, one's called the Realm. But again, just, just emphasising the point that this measures only reading and writing abilities. So in this systematic review, what we did is because um, the functional health literacy measures measure different things, um, sorry, they measure health literacy, but they do it in different ways, uh, we can't kind of group them together. So that's why you'll see there's different percentages here. But I guess what we did is we looked at like the mean rates um, for each of the, the measures used. So two studies used the, the TOFLA, and there was about a, a mean rate of 27% identified inadequate health literacy levels within this population. Uh, and then using the realm, 48% um, identified inadequate health literacy levels within this population. Um, and some studies found adequate levels. And so I think what's really important and what we really uh, what we realized is that there is so much variability um, in uh, measurement and in definition of health literacy, particularly those that were using functional measures. Um, and so it's really difficult to, uh, I guess, make a conclusive um, to, to give conclusive rates around, you know, uh, the, the level of uh, lower health literacy or inadequate health literacy that this population experiences. Um, one study looked at, uh, it was Clausen in, in 2016, um, examined adults living with serious mental illness attending a day rehabilitation program. So it's the same sample and they actually just administered multiple functional health literacy measures. Um, and the levels of inadequate health literacy range from 42% to 66%. Okay, so the same sample, but just different measures. And you can see that based just, just from using the, the different measures, um, different health literacy levels came about. So again, just really highlights also the limitations of functional health literacy tools. Um, and obviously it's really good that we've really shifted from that. It's very rare that the kind of people use these tools these days. Um, we uh, compared the rates of inadequate health literacy to the general Australian population rates, um, which are like these rates respectively. Um, and those living with a mental illness just seem to have higher rates of inadequate health literacy. So it kind of let us know like, you know, this might be a, a population that experienced lower health literacy compared to, to the general population. Um, and also highlighting no one had looked at a multidimensional health literacy outside of our own research. And so um, it, it just really emphasised the importance of um, taking on this program of research and really looking at the multidimensional health literacy of people living with mental health and substance use disorders. So our first study, as I mentioned, was just looking at people accessing community mental health services to begin with. So up here, and the, the next three slides look the same in terms of how I've presented the research. So up here is just kind of demographic characteristic information. Here are the profiles that I was talking about or harping on about, I should say. So using the latent profile analysis. And these are the strengths and difficulties that the, that the population, the sample, sorry, are having um, in terms of their health literacy. So the ticks are the strengths, so these two here, and the crosses are, are the things that they struggle most with. And then here is just some more information um, which I will, I will go through. So for this particular sample, you know, 67% were presenting with depression, anxiety, 38% were permanently unable to work or due to illness. So it's so quite a significant um, number there, quite high. 57% were smokers and 90% had a healthcare card. And the healthcare card is um, an uh, Australian thing. Um, and basically a healthcare card um, is given to someone um, to receive concession um, on, on healthcare um, medicines and some discounts. Um, in order to be eligible for a healthcare card, you have to be receiving government benefits. So it, it's kind of, um, we can kind of say that 90% of people are also receiving government um, benefits because they need that in order to be eligible for a healthcare card. Um, so this is also a population that, that may be on the, the, the lower level of socioeconomic status as well. Okay, so 
basically when we when we um, analyzed the results of the health literacy questionnaire and input it into this fancy analysis, um, we, we came out with three health literacy profiles. So these are not predetermined, but they're labeled based on um, their levels. So there was a group that was lowest health literacy relative to the population. So that was 20% of the sample sat within that lowest category. Then um, 60%, so the majority sat in that moderate category. And then 18% sat in that highest health literacy category. So again, highlights that the same sample, not everyone's going to be the same. Um, people are going to kind of fit into different profiles or subgroups of health literacy. Um, so I guess a, 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 an important point to remember. Um, it, as I said, with the health literacy questionnaire, we um, one of the really uh, amazing benefits is that we can then separate based on the nine domains where people are having um, where people have strengths in terms of their health literacy, and then where they may be struggling a little bit. So this population, um, we're we're pretty good at understanding, feeling understood and supported by healthcare providers, and understanding health information well enough to know what to do. But they struggled. Um, much more on being able to appraise health information, to navigate the healthcare system and finding good health information. I also find this stuff quite interesting when you picture the context at which we're, we're measuring um, this in. So they're, they're accessing community mental health treatment, but they're, they're finding these things really difficult. So what we actually what we found is that there were no demographic characteristics, no difference sorry, in demographic characteristics, except that the lowest profiles, so this profile here, were more likely than the highest profile to have a healthcare card. So they were more likely to kind of sit in that category. And um, there were no differences between these three profiles on mental health conditions. So that's just saying that um, regardless of the mental health condition that the um, person had, it didn't um, indicate that they would sit in a, they were more likely to sit in one of these subgroups than the other. Um, so across most, so remembering with this sample, we then compared the results to a general population and then to a population um, accessing residential substance use treatment. So across most domains, so except two domains, so remember there's nine domains, so two of those domains um, were non-significant. So across all the domains that were significant, the mental health population had lower health literacy compared to the general population. So I guess this is one of the, the striking findings. It's, it's like, yep, like they do have lower health literacy and it's significantly different. Um, compared with the substance use population, this was fairly interesting. The health literacy varied across the domains. So for example, domains one to five, the substance use population were lower. Domains six to nine, the substance use population were higher and the mental health population were lower. Again, this kind of highlights, um, I think, the, the crossover between these two population groups. As I previously mentioned, there is a lot of co-occurring or comorbidity between substance use disorders and mental health. So it's kind of unsurprising that their health literacy scores kind of vary. Um, and, and sometimes one sample is, um, is higher and the other, another instance, they're, they're lower. So moving on to the, the second study that, that we conducted. And this study was looking at people accessing substance use treatment, so residential substance use, so in, inpatient. Um, again, up here you can see these are just the demographic characteristics. So a majority sample were, were male. 43.8% um, um, had their primary substance of concern going into rehab as amphetamines. Um, so this was um, the, the highest uh, uh, primary substance of concern and the, the most common um, uh, mental health disorder was um, depression. So 56% um, indicated that they also um, experienced depression. So again, highlighting just that, that kind of overlap, um, the comorbidity there. So again, as you see, these are the three profiles relative to this population. So we got three profiles. So remember, that's not predetermined. So we also found that there was this lowest category, there was this moderate group, and then the the, then there was this highest category. So um, in this sample, um, not as many people fitted into that lowest category. That was 15%, still, still concerning. The moderate health literacy group, 59%, and the highest health literacy group, 25%. So again, just indicating people can, can vary across these, these groups. Um, strengths and, and, and difficulties, so they had the strength was, was understanding health information well enough to know what to do. So they felt they were, they were quite capable in doing that. But again, this appraising, and it kind of keeps coming up, um, they, they really struggle or find this the most difficult, um, which is appraising health information. 
So I don't know if you remember, um, but uh, in terms of this program of research or this study in particular, we then looked at their service use. So I wanted to know, um, you know, that the research suggests that lower health literacy is linked to, you know, higher um, kind of poorer rates of service use, but also sometimes higher rates of more um, like acute health care. And so, you know, again, this is a population that need to access the healthcare system. And so we wanted to examine their, their health service utilisation and actually to see if this was related to um, their health literacy level. So um, the questionnaire measures um, service use within the 12 months prior to, to the assessment. Um, so in in terms of alcohol and other drug services, the highest um, AOD service was, the highest used, sorry, was um, withdrawal management. So 36% had used withdrawal management um, within the 12 months and half attended the service more than once within 12 months. Um, in terms of primary healthcare services, um, there were high rates of contact with a GP. So 81% in the last 12 months had contact with a GP. 63% said it was due to their AOD use. Um, this uh, rate of uh, contact with a GP is actually standard to the general Australian population rate, so um, which sit at about 80%. Um, in terms of mental health services, so things like seeing a psychologist, 26% um, um, said that they accessed a mental health service. Um, and again, this is fairly consistent with the general Australian population. And then I guess this is where we, we, we see much higher rates of, of acute healthcare services. So high access and high return to acute healthcare. So for example, 55% of the population um, who used an ambulance or attended a hospital emergency department did so more than once um, in, in 12 months. The rates of return to things like AOD um, services um, and uh sorry, mental health services um, was, was really low. Um, so, you know, seeing a psychologist, usually you don't do it once. Um, you generally encourage to go more than once. Um, and, and that was quite low in terms of its return. But in terms of people returning and, and using ED or an ambulance service was, was really high. Um, and their um, rates of acute healthcare uh, service use was much higher than, than the general population. So, then we wanted to look at whether there was a difference between the profiles in terms of, you know, does the lowest profile access more acute healthcare services? And we found it wasn't the case. So we actually found that the that the regardless of the profiles, um, people were all this sample were all using the the services to the same rate. Um, so I guess we didn't find that that lowest health literacy was linked um, to, to more acute service use. However, I guess it just highlights that, you know, this population obviously really accessing these services quite a lot. Um, and again, just something to consider when we're talking about um, tools and strategies and who might be able to kind of help in terms of um, enhancing or bolstering people's health literacy. So the final study that we did was a longitudinal study. So we had a baseline assessment and then we followed people up six months post residential substance use treatment. So again, here, just some demographics. So, um, you know, 44% of, of this sample indicated alcohol as their primary substance of concern, followed by methamphetamine being 39%. Again, three profiles were found, so um, similar rates to, to the other profiles, but, you know, the lowest profile, 22% sat in that, moderate, 48%, um, and highest, 29%. And again, this, this, this difficulty here, appraising health information, it still sits there. So it still sits as, as their, um, the most difficult thing for them to do. Um, but they had the strength, again, of um, understanding health information well enough to know what to do. So what is really promising is that post-residential treatment, we found that um, six months after health literacy significantly improved for people <clears throat> in the lowest and moderate profiles on most of the domains of health literacy. So um, that's really promising. Um, we didn't implement a health literacy intervention. So that's really important to remember. This is, I guess, just them accessing residential substance use disorder treatment alone and seeing that it's significantly improved. At six Six months, the health literacy scores for people within the lowest and moderate profiles remain significantly lower than, particip than participants in the highest profile. So despite um, them improving, the, the kind of um, people that's sitting in this lowest health literacy category still remained really low um, compared to the high. So it just indicates that 
they're not improving to a degree or to a level that sits them in, in one of these kind of highest health literacy profiles. Um, and again, what's really concerning is that six months, the lowest profile had higher psychological distress scores and lower quality of life scores compared to the highest profile. So we know that people in these lowest health literacy categories in these populations, um, based on some other research we've done, um, have poorer health outcomes um, and poorer treatment outcomes. And this just highlights the point that despite them improving in health literacy post-treatment, they still had poorer, um, psych lower psychological distress scores and lower quality of life. Again, this is, I, I will kind of skip over this, but this is just um, the, the difference in the um, profiles in terms of how it's increased. You can use the legend there to, to help you um, uh, interpret that. Um, so I guess just an overview, you know, three profiles of health literacy were identified, lowest, moderate, highest. It indicates that this population will vary. Not, it's not a one size fits all. Most people do fall in the lowest and moderate categories. <clears throat> On average, people accessing specialist mental health treatment experience lower health literacy than the general population. It's similar to a substance use population. The substance use population access high rates of acute healthcare services. Um, as I said, participants with lower health literacy experience poorer quality of life, higher, higher psycho psychological distress. And although health literacy improves over time, um, the people within the lowest profile still, um, are, I guess, more vulnerable and disadvantaged in that sense. Um, again, just highlighting, feel free, you know, I, I'm just aware of the time, so I won't take up too much longer, but you'll get these slides as well. So this is just indicating there are other, there's other research out there as well um, since, since we've embarked on our program. Um, and again, it just highlights this population experience lower health literacy levels, and it's something that we really need to start to be aware of in terms of addressing. In terms of addressing, no health literacy intervention exists. And that's, I guess, my next um, kind of uh, journey I am looking into in terms of um, developing some ideas around like how can we help improve health literacy? Um, but, but nothing exists. There are promising, you know, our, our findings are promising to say that, you know, say residential rehab um, can indirectly improve health literacy um, without doing anything specific, health literacy specific. Um, but uh, I guess this might highlight as well that, that these services might be a place where we can actually implement a real solid um, health literacy intervention. So it's not all doom and gloom um, and just a couple of slides until I, I finish. This is just highlighting that, that you know, um, that there are things that we can do. There are things that you guys can do in terms of helping to enhance this population and their health literacy. Um, I do think that all health practitioners, services and people who are in contact with populations living with mental illness and substance use disorders do have a level of responsibility to be aware of and enhance health literacy of consumers. We can't turn blind to the fact that this is a population who are more likely to experience lower health literacy than the general population and they do experience poorer health outcomes. So they're really vulnerable. Um, and I think we, we play a really... Um, important part and it's quite a, quite a privilege that, that we can um, play a role in, in terms of um, enhancing and helping people in terms of their health literacy. So one thing that I'd encourage is that we measure health literacy, um, maybe using a multidimensional tool. Again, I'm aware that that's not always possible because it takes time to administer this stuff and, and, and you know, us as health practitioners, I'm sure, have a lot of on our, on our plate. Um, but you can also just ask the questions with, with people and don't assume someone's health literacy. Just ask them, you know, how do you go? You know, if I was to give you a, a worksheet or, or this, this health information, like how would you feel about interpreting that? Do you feel confident enough to be able to do that? So just by asking can actually gather, allow you to gather some information on, on how um, one's health literacy, what it looks like. Um, appraising health information was a consistent difficulty experienced by this population. People on this domain tend to experience difficulty understanding most health information and can become confused when facing conflicting information. Something to really be aware of then and, and thinking about um, uh, helping people uh, in this category um, and provide greater um, support to consumers when assessing health information. Put a QR code here. This is the AHRQ Health Literacy Universal Precautions Toolkit. It's on the next page as well, so don't worry. Um, but I really encourage you to look at this. This has amazing, uh, so many tools, practical, easy to implement, some more difficult, but depending on what time you have with, with consumers and how much time you think you have in terms of um, being able to invest in helping people enhance their health literacy, I think this is a really good place to start. Just highlighting a couple of these, like the teach back tool, so asking consumers to repeat instructions that, that you've given them. 
um, making and helping them encourage uh, action plans, following up. So, you know, you might have given them some things to do, like follow up with them and, and check in with how they're going with it. Um, raising awareness, so just educating staff um, that this is a, a population who experience lower levels and that they they can be quite vulnerable to to poorer health outcomes. So educating people on this, so even you know reception staff and things like that at clinics can also be aware of. So when people call up, they can help guide people with the information they need, rather than maybe saying that's not the service we do and, and hanging up uh, as an example. Um, and to use health information effectively, so circle or highlight important information. So I guess just highlights that. In this toolkit, there are some really easy to use practical strategies that, that won't take up much time. Um, so I really, really encourage you to have a look at that and see like, what is one or two things I can start to implement um, or, or that I can take away and implement with consumers or just everyday people I interact with. So very final, I promise I will uh, finish up. Um, we need to measure, be aware of health literacy levels. I know I've kind of probably honed this point quite a lot, um, but we also need to just be aware that it's not all the same. It's not a one size fits all. Um, it will differ depend, uh, even with individuals attending the same service. Um, they experience lower health literacy, greater challenges compared with uh, general population. Um, they access GPs quite regularly in acute healthcare services. So thinking about if you're a GP or you're in an acute healthcare service, how can I play a, you probably play a really critical role in assessing and improving health literacy given this population access these services at high rates. Um, it's not all doom and gloom, health literacy can improve and it does, um, but we need to kind of do more in terms of enhancing that. Um, and we need to focus on addressing health literacy and impl implementing tools like I previously described in lower health literacy groups in particular. So thank you. I will finish off there. Thank you so much for um, coming along today and, and listening. Um, there's a bunch of references if anyone's super interested there. Um, but again, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Taylor. Uh, Dr. Deacon, that was a thank you <laughs> great presentation. Um, we're going to have a few minutes for questions. And then I was also just wondering, because of the time, Dr. Deacon, would you be willing to stay a few more minutes if people have questions? And then yes, we absolutely. Okay. And then we will give the code um, at the top of the hour. We'll give the code for all of you to claim credit. Uh, I'm going to try sharing my screen now. Okay, so uh, let's open up the, the chat box or excuse me, the Q&A box for questions. But for those of you who need to head out now, um, here is the slide with the evaluation link and the code. So um, in the question box, let's see, the first question is, are there major differences in health literacy rates among ethnic and racial groups based on SES and educational levels? And I think you talked about that already a little bit. Did you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, it's a really good question. There's lots of research out there um, in terms of general populations and, and physical health and things like that. Um, in our suit, so, so we... Um, you know, uh, looked at whether there were any differences in, in all of our groups, there were no differences. Um, but the, the common um, thing that we see is that, uh, yeah, lower educational level um, is often linked to, to lower health literacy. So um, something that, yeah, we didn't find significant in, in our, um, our group, but yes, absolutely, uh, is, is research is known in, in that area around that. Great. And the second question is, should we teach health literacy in public schools to help children get a foundation on health literacy? Oh, yes. Wouldn't that be amazing? I um, was talking to someone the other day and um, I was doing like a podcast and we were talking about health literacy just in private practice and as a psychologist. And, you know, I said, I, I don't think anyone, you know, or I did definitely didn't in primary school or high school get taught about um, we have a Medicare system. So even our like healthcare model and private healthcare and how you access um, help if you experience X, Y, or Z conditions, like it just isn't taught. And that's where it's like, it completely falls on like social interactions with, um, with others. It, it falls on, you know, generations of information being passed down to parents and caregivers. But also thinking about that, like if someone isn't getting that information from school and they're at the only sources, 
you know, what happens if they're going home and maybe their parental caregiver also has lower health literacy and maybe isn't very confident or has experienced shame before um, being with the doctor? Um, that would likely then kind of imprint on that child or that young person to go, um, yeah, I also don't like the doctor because, you know, mum or dad or whoever it is um, has, has said that they didn't have a good experience. So I think schools play a really would play a really big role in, in helping um, enhance health literacy. And it's a real concern that, that, that they don't do that. So yes, I agree. <laughs> um, someone else asks, how can we address health literacy needs of those of these populations in acute care hospital settings? Yeah, so I guess so as I said, I guess there's there's different ways to address health literacy. There's a specific health literacy interventions, you know, and that takes a lot of time in terms of its development. It also, um, you know, takes a lot of research to, to kind of get it right. Um, and I, I'm not really too sure that anything's been done in specific services like that, um, irrespective of mental health or substance use. But I think it just comes down to thinking about trying to kind of come away with it feeling super overwhelmed, like, oh, it's too big and you know, um, I, it, I just, you know, it, it's too big of a problem and I can't do anything about it. Um, you know, use the QR code that I, I kind of did or, or look up that um, the health literacy uh, toolkit. And even just, as I said, even if it's just starting with with one strategy that that, that maybe you use, and it might be, as I said, you know, um, as a, an emergency department, a lot of people present to emergency departments, um, you know, maybe for substance use issues and they might get turned away because it's like, no, you don't come here, like you're fine, it's not an emergency, like go away. Um, and this is me generalising here. But, you know, potentially rather than like doing that, it might be more of an open, like a, a open door policy um, around like, oh, I'm noticing that you're presenting to EDs, this is the second time you've come in, in you know, the, the year. Do you actually know where like you could get help for the problems that you're addressing? And then helping people or guiding people in terms of accessing that information, providing them with the phone number or providing them um, with, you know, a, a website link or whatever it might be. And it obviously is going to be very specific to the um, the problem that maybe acute healthcare services are seeing. But I guess just again, highlighting thinking outside the box, how can, if we're like the first port of call for people potentially coming in um, and maybe they, they're they not appropriately accessing us, they're not accessing our service appropriately, how can I help inform them or guide them to accessing services that are appropriate to have their needs met? Thank you. Someone else says, I work at a cancer-focused nonprofit, and people often seek out information on behalf of their family member or to learn about their condition. Is there any research about the impact of proxy use on health literacy or the health literacy of the proxy? Um, <clears throat> no, but I mean... I mean, I shouldn't say no, sorry, not that I've, not that I'm involved in or I'm aware of, but I, I think that there probably would be, um, where I'm, I'm working on a paper at the moment that's actually looking at health literacy of mental health, um, workers, um, and if that, you know, like measuring their health literacy and kind of the impact of, you know, if you're a mental health worker and have lower health literacy, how is that maybe going to um, yeah, interact or impact on someone else? Um, I would suspect that, again, looking at the definition of health literacy and the impact of generations or, um, you know, family members and, and where people get their skills and um, abilities, competencies from, um, I think that there probably would be some research out there. I'd encourage you to have a look, um, but I'm not kind of across that or aware of that. And someone else asks, how do you ask sensitive questions about health literacy without sounding condescending or rude? Yeah, so I, I guess maybe an example of like a, a non-sensitive question would be like, um, you know, can you read or can you write um, potentially? I, I guess just being human, um, being empathetic um, and, you know, uh, I think just yeah, approaching things and asking things in a really genuine way and showing that you really care, I think um, even just helps in terms of delivery of questions. But even like we, with clients that I see in, in private practice as a psychologist, I might be like, oh, I'm just checking in. Like, um, how's your reading and writing ability? So I'm using it as like, I'm really curious about your reading and writing ability. I'm not, I'm not saying that based on what you've, you know, presented to me, I think that you can't read or write. Um, but, you know, and then I might ask, you know, I, I kind of throughout my um, work, I, I might present like a, 
of various bits of information. How do you like receiving information? Do you like it in, in visual form? Or if I was to give you, you know, a, a sheet full of words, do you, do you like that stuff? And some clients are like, yep, give me all the, the papers, give me all the research, whereas others are like, oh, nah, like I can't deal with words. I just won't look at it. So I think it's just about being really curious and open-minded about people's preferences and just asking rather than assuming. So potentially maybe that um, being a way that you can address that in a more sensitive way. Yeah, I'm not sure if that answered that question, but hopefully it's given some ideas. Yeah. Um, we have one more uh, question that says, in your research, did you find any differences among health literacy groups based on income level? Yeah, as I, I kind of mentioned before, in terms of um, any demographics or anything that we found where differences it will be in the slides, um, but no, we didn't. There was no significant difference. Um, and again, like that could be because like, you know, all the population have a very similar income level. Again, what was kind of interesting about that first study um, or second study after the systematic review around income was, again, um, just highlighting the healthcare card thing. Um, so, you know, people in the lower health literacy group are more likely to have a healthcare card. In order to get a healthcare card in Australia, you need to be receiving government um, benefits. So, you know, you may um, be struggling um, uh, based on income, so things like that. Um, but no, we didn't find like a direct kind of association in, in our results, but it's absolutely something that is found in the general general research around um, health literacy and lower socioeconomic status. Yeah. We, we do have a few more questions if you have time. Yeah, sure. That's fine. Um, someone asks, is the Ask Me 3 health literacy program effective with this group or used with this group in a specific way? Are you familiar with the Ask Me 3 health literacy program? No, I haven't, but I am going to, I'm like, that's probably something I should be aware of. Um, I'm going to write it in. Um, ask me three. Um, no, I'm not aware of that, um, but I will absolutely look at that and, um, yeah, hopefully have an answer to your question in the future. But thank you for bringing that to my attention. Great. Um, this is more of an opinion, your opinion. Should medical personnel be trained in health literacy? Again, yes, it probably sounds obvious that I'm going to answer yes to that. I feel very strongly about it. Um, but also, again, I feel strongly about it because I do think we have, as medical professionals, as health practitioners, um, have a level of responsibility if we're in contact with consumers to really like be kind and um, and open about helping people who are struggling with, with health literacy. And I think it would be so wonderful if they um, did that in, um, you know, their training. And I wish I did it in my training and we don't. But, um, yeah, I think it's just a matter of um, these types of practitioners or, or when you're in a client-facing role um, that you're just aware that, that health literacy is a problem for this population. And so this person presenting um, to treatment or presenting to my service um, just being mindful that, that that could be their experience and that they might have lower health literacy and what does that link to? And then how can I help ensure that this service is appropriate for them and that they um, kind of are guided in the right direction in that sense? Yeah. We had one question just pop up. Do you yeah. feel there may be a discrepancy in research in Australia versus other parts of the world due to treatment options for substance use disorders and mental health uh, and substance use of choice? Are you looking into comparing data from other parts of the world or are you focusing more on Australia? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think why I highlighted like the caveat of, you know, this obviously is an Australian specific population. I don't think that um, doesn't mean that we can't, um, you know, uh, like generalize some of the results or um, use those results in, say, the US. Um, but yeah, obviously some services differ. So it would be really, really interesting for, for people to conduct research um, in those areas. I don't think anyone has, um, to my knowledge. There's definitely been some studies in Europe. Um, I know um, Rolova, Rolova um, I think Czech Republic, they're a Czech Republic. Um, that person's done some research since my research has come about and, and doing really similar things and comparing stuff to my research. That's been really good to, to help us build on the evidence in this area. Um, but absolutely probably something that um, I would be looking at in the, in the future. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't say no. Okay. And there's one question that I think had been in the chat and I was just going to address. I apologize if I've missed any others in the chat that would just popped That's into okay. the Q&A. 
Dr. Deegan, I work in orthopedic surgery. We administer a musculoskeletal health literacy assessment to all pre-op patients. Are there other questionnaires you can recommend for the use that are within 10 to 15 questions versus the 44 in the HLQ? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, that's so awesome that, that you do that. Um, that's really good good to hear. Um, oh, I think I was looking at this before I presented around um, even if uh, Osborne and, you know, uh, the developers of the HLQ have developed anything um, shorter and there was there was kind of nothing out there. There was only like an online tool which is shorter, but it measures like e-health literacy. Um, nothing that I am aware of or, or would be comfortable recommending. Um, it's I think, you know, there's obviously a reason why the HLQ is a 44-item questionnaire and it does, um, you know, take a while. And I think it's because it is really well validated and it does encompass this multidimensional construct of health literacy. Um, but again, completely aware that things like that um, do really impact on time. Um, I would encourage you to look through the questionnaire um, and you can absolutely pull out, like there were some studies I, I have looked at in this area um, where they just looked at measured like two of the domains. Um, and I think that's also okay. Um, so maybe thinking about what the musculoskeletal health literacy assessment does and, and ask questions um, to that to the patients and then maybe seeing if there's any additional um, items on the health literacy questionnaire that you could even pull out um, that obviously map onto the domains and kind of use that as a bit of a more comprehensive health literacy assessment that might benefit people um, post-surgery. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Deegan. It, it looks like those are all of our questions. Um, and so I just want to thank you all for coming here um, and for the great comments in the chat box. It looks like people are going to use this information and, um, and thank you to Dr. Deegan for presenting. I, I think that's all we have today. Um, Thanks so much, um, Nora. I so appreciate um, being asked to, to come along here and hopefully uh, everyone has taken away some, some little bits of information. So thanks so much again. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.